Hi, uh, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm a web designer, uh, and I'm also production director at Cyberduck. Uh, and in that job, I do everything from research right through to um, information architecture through to actually delivering interfaces. Uh, as you can see, I'm also a bit of a pop culture fiend, and I occasionally like to dress up as a Wookiee. Uh, but I'm not going to be. Oh, oh. Yeah. I do, yes. <laughs> oh, clicker malfunction. Let me go with a different clicker. But that's not what I'm talking about this evening, fortunately. Uh, okay. So instead, tonight I'm going to talk to you about clients. Um, so, no shock horror or anything like that. But specifically, I'm going to talk about working with clients better. Um, because I think we can do better. And that's all well and good, but what on earth does that have to do with UX, I hear you ask. And I'm glad you asked. Because, does this look familiar to, to anybody in here? Raise, raise your hands if this sort of thing looks familiar. Sending designs over to clients and getting feedback and you're feeling like your design's getting destroyed sometimes and you're sending it to your boss and you feel like you, you know, the user experience is, is getting sort of destroyed by, by these people. And sometimes when that happens, it can feel like a supervillain is swooping down and destroying the user experience and sort of adding unnecessary features or pointless changes or just sometimes plain daft ideas. Um, Who's familiar with Clients from Hell? Yeah, most of you. Anybody submitted a story to Clients from Hell? None of you, None of you are willing to admit it, at least. Um, fortunately, that says, can we make the pig sexier up there, by the way? Um, fortunately, we've never been asked to make a pig sexier. Um, I'm not quite sure how we would go about that. But um, I have had some very frustrating requests from clients before. Um, one time, we were asked to put Green Day Time of Your Life on an email signature and uh, so that it would auto play every time somebody received an email from that client. And besides that being kind of sociopathic, um, a song you know, from a band that's about drugs, probably not the best uh, representation of their company. Um, but a lot of the time, the stories that I see on Clients from Hell, I think are entirely avoidable with a better process and better client management and working better with our clients. Uh, things like making the logo bigger, crazy timelines, things like that, I think are actually entirely avoidable things. And actually, I think often it's a monster of our own making. And it's about time we started taking responsibility as designers for the design work that we're putting out into the world. I love client work. And at Cyberduck, I've been lucky to work with some really smart clients, really, really smart people. And I love working with them. But I, th I feel like I've learned a lot from, thank you very much, uh, from the times where things haven't gone to plan too well. Um, and I think client work's incredibly rewarding. Um, you get to work on interesting and varied projects for industries that you probably knew very little about before, and that's certainly true for myself. Um, I didn't know much about protein or any finance or any of the sorts of industries that I've worked with um, before I started working with them. And it's great because you learn a lot but you also get to find creative answers to diverse problems that you didn't even know existed. Um, but I'm not going to pretend it's not a challenge, uh, as this quote from Mark Bolton sums up quite nicely for me. Um, the design process is weird and complicated because it involves people who are also weird and complicated. So what I'm actually talking about is relationships and how we, as the designers, the experts, can improve those relationships. And I think there's three key facets to a successful and productive client relationship, or even a relationship with your boss, um, if you work in-house. Um, or just about any relationship, I guess. And these are empathy, trust, and communication. I'm going to go into each in a little bit more depth. Empathy is something we talk a lot about in UX. And usually when we talk about empathy, we're referring to our users, and about sort of understanding the needs of our users and how we can make things better for our users, actually genuinely improve their lives. Um, I think a little bit of empathy towards our clients could also go a long way. If you put yourself in your client's shoes for a moment, they've, they're in a position perhaps where they're not experts in this field, they're not experts when it comes to digital, and they've had to hire somebody to solve a problem that they can't alone. So it's important to 
set the roles from the project right from the outset, what the client can expect from you, what you expect from them, and then you can manage those expectations and be the leader on the project, which is essentially what you've been hired to do. And often when projects go wrong, it's when the client starts micromanaging you and sort of trying, trying to sort of seize back the reins of control on the project, it's because you've not done a very good job with leading the project and leading the client. And often you end up in a situation where you have sort of Bill Lumberg-esque character. Uh, anybody familiar with Office Space? Yeah, good. Uh, and they end up sort of micromanaging you. So there are some techniques that we use uh, at Cyberduck. So we uh, often, before we even start working with the client, we hold one-on-one -on -one interviews with them um, before we start the project and before we do any kickoff meetings or anything like that. And we, it's a chance for us to meet them informally. Obviously, we do have questions that we ask them, but it's, it's quite informal. It's, 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 it's a chance to meet them and learn about their understanding of the project, what their expectations are, and what's critical to the success of the project, and often what obstacles we might face. And I've definitely found examples similar to this Paul Boag quote, that the turning point in many interviews is when the interviewee gets up and closes the office door and lowers their voice. And there have definitely been times where we've done that. We've gone into an organization, and you'll find one or two people in that organization who won't give you the bullshit and will actually give you the honest sort of baggage that can, comes with the project and understanding of what's involved in that project. And then you can tailor your process according to that. You can actually understand the team dynamics and uh, tailor your process according to that. This, uh, I'm not sure you can all see the Steelbook comic up here, but one-on-one -on -one interviews and, and doing this stuff at the start of the project helps you to agree on the project goals. And it avoids shifting goals during the project. So if you agree on the business objectives right at the start, you can avoid having the goalposts moving whilst you're working. Mutual trust is incredibly important for a productive client relationship. And this largely depends on your integrity, your reliability, your transparency, and mutual respect. If you're consistently honest with your client, they'll respect your integrity and always, always avoid the trap of overpromising and under-delivering. Um, it can be easy to fall into that trap often when you're working on a project and there's time pressures to, to f fall into the trap of promising to do stuff when actually that doesn't give you the time to do, to do a, your proper job. And even when it's during a quiet part of the project, pick up the phone and give the client an update anyway even if there's not much to report, and they'll respect you for your honesty. So, you know, you're in a quiet bit, perhaps it's in development or something like that. Pick up the phone to the client and just give them updates every week. Often, the clients jump in and start micromanaging because you're not doing that, because they feel like they need to chase you for what's going on in the pr their project that they're paying for. And always deliver when you say you will. Be reliable. That means being honest about how long it will take you to do a considered job. You're the expert here. so. You know how long it will take to do something, and be honest with your client about that. I love this quote from John Cleese. This is uh, from a video that he did early 90s um, at a video arts forum. And I, I, I'll put the link at the bottom of the slide there, but it's, I genuinely recommend you watch it. It's a talk that he does about creativity. And what he says is the extraordinary thing about creativity is if you keep your mind resting against a subject in a friendly but persistent way, sooner or later you get a reward from your unconscious but only if you put the pondering time in first. And I think that's incredibly important, that whilst projects may have time pressures, you need to be honest with your, yourself and with your client and give yourself the pondering time, the time to actually consider the problem and deal with, you know, get underneath the sort of fingernail of the pro problem. And being transparent is, uh, is, very, is also a very good way to, to get clients on board with, with, with your process. It's often easier to explain the rationale behind a design if a client's been involved throughout, to take them on the journey with you. They often know, will know a lot about their industry, so you can get a lot of insight from that as well. And we've had, we've had quite a few clients where we've done this, where we've been very transparent, we've involved them in our process, and they've actually thanked us. They've, they've said, wow, that's, we're so grateful that you've actually involved us so much in, in what you've been doing, that we, we understand how, how, you, how all, the, all the sort of nuances that are going into what you're creating. And the point is, surprises suck. People hate surprises, and none more so than clients. Whether it's finding out your father is a Sith Lord, or that a design doesn't match your expectation, 
surprises suck. So there are a couple of things you can do. Conducting workshops, I think, is a really smart thing. And doing that kind of thing in early on in the project to sort of plan content strategy, information architecture, sketch flows with your client, sketch interfaces, try to get underneath the problem and get your client's input and expectations right at the start throughout that whole process. Exposing your clients directly to research is also another way that I found you get them on board a lot easier. Um, often what we will do is we'll do some research and then we'll present our clients with a report. But that does, that's very disconnected. The client will see a user in that report and that's just a person on a piece of paper. Whereas if you actually take them along to research sessions and actually directly involved in those research sessions, the clients can actually see face to face what their customers are saying. And often we've had um, clients that have been surprised with actually what their customers actually think when we take them along to sessions. They're like, actually, crikey, I didn't actually think my users thought like that. And this Charles Paul quote sums that up. There's a direct correlation between the exposure and the improvements we see in the designs that a team produces. And this is because a client's more likely to empathize with their user if they've been directly party to interviews and what the users are saying. Another facet of, of trust is that you need to have mutual respect with the client. And you don't get mutual respect by treating your client with reverence like the godfather. Don't put your client on a pedestal, but don't also be the no guy. So don't talk down to your client, and instead try to find a balance and work with your client as an equal. Try to be patient and courteous and hear them out, even if you think some of their suggestions are just plain ridiculous. Design isn't about your ego, and nothing quite kills a client relationship quite like a dismissive designer scoffing at them. Instead, try to frame critiques of, against the goals of the design and how it affects the users. For example, the client might be asking you to make the logo bigger, or the pig sexier, or the background pink. Try to instead try to frame that problem as, try to frame the critique against the problem. Rather than the client suggesting solutions, what, what is the problem that that's solving? What is the problem making the, big, the logo bigger or the pig sexier? What is that, the problem that that's actually solving? And by staying positive and, and investigating the underlying problem, you can avoid being the no person. So you can suggest alternatives, but without actually coming across as the no person. Communications the integral part of any client relationship and often is the area where many failed projects break down um, and it's certainly what I, I've seen before. And so try to create a framework that encourages structured feedback. Who's familiar with the two Ronnies? Yeah? Everybody seen this sketch before? It's a brilliant sketch. So one of the, Ronnie Barker comes into the shop, asks for fork handles, the other Ronnie goes away and gets fork candles and hilarity ensues. <coughs> Try to actively avoid misinterpretation like this. I mean, the similar things like this can often happen on projects where you just innocently send an email away and a client completely interprets it in a different way to the way you intended to. <coughs> so when you're struggling to write a sensitive email, stop trying and pick up the phone instead. It's often easier to communicate face to face or by phone with somebody than it is to, to email. So avoid email ping pong. It doesn't benefit you or the client. Don't simply just send an email asking a client what they think about a JPEG and expect an informed, rational, objective response. What you're actually doing is appealing to their inner Caesar when you do that kind of thing. Um, and there's two points here. First, email is a crappy way to explain the nuances involved in making a design work in the responsive, multi-device world that we currently live in. It creates false expectations. Secondly, stop asking people what they think. You're not actually interested in what your client thinks. What you're interested about is whether you think the design solves the objectives that you set early on in the project. Does, does it help achieve those objectives? Um, and what you often find when you send a design just innocently across what you think by email, it results in a game of sort of design feedback Chinese whispers, where the feedback gets further and further and further removed from any context that, you know, all the thought that's gone into it, and becomes more based on personal opinion example, what my mum thinks about this particular colour, or my daughter doesn't like this font and wants Comic Sans because she loves Comic Sans. That, it, it's important to avoid that kind of thing. So instead, sit, insist on structured design critiques face-to-face -face where you can explain your thought process that's gone into the design and ensure that the feedback remains goal-oriented. 
and there are a couple of ways you can do this. So sketch face to face with the client. And sometimes you'll find when you first get into the room with a client, if you're doing sketching and things like that, they might be a little bit resistant towards it. But once you explain that you're just drawing boxes, we're just, we're just experimenting with ideas here, you often find the clients actually really get into it. Um, and that's from like MDs of huge companies actually getting really into do, doing sketches and essentially collaborating with you on, on, on UX work. Um, create prototypes to show the experience and the work, how that will work and flow. So rather than telling somebody how it might work, actually build something, just quickly knock together something and actually show how that might work. And use techniques like style tiles and pattern libraries to get visual design feedback separate from interface design feedback so that the client doesn't get bogged down in the colors or the fonts or things like that that you're using. Sort of keep, keep, try to keep those separate and then sort of bring them together as a whole once, once you've managed to get their input at each point. And it's important to test any assumptions that you're making, which is everything that you're doing in design is assumption. So it's important to challenge those assumptions that have been made and be prepared to back up your arguments. Here you can use data from your research that you've done, uh, pre previous projects that you've done perhaps, or even credible examples by others to back up your arguments. Uh, a recent example of this was a client wanted to have like a carousel interface, which often a sort of quite popular sort of choice for people just because it saves the problem of having a lot of content on a page but answering, you know, each department wants it to be first on the home page. We can solve that with a carousel. And we actually, there was research done by um, several people in the industry, including Brad Frost, which found that carousels actually weren't working. And then we actually were able to sort of find a better design solution from, from using that argument. So empathy, trust, and communication, they're the foundations of making client relationships better. So next time you encounter a stubborn, or difficult client that seems like they're getting in your way, consider what you could have done differently before automatically putting the blame on their shoulders. Could you have defined the roles that better at the start of the project? Did you set and manage their expectations? And did you do that honestly and consistently? Did you collaborate and involve them as an equal during the project? And did you structure feedback appropriately? Sometimes it may well have been out of your control. After all, no matter how much you try, you can't stop some people from sticking beans up their nose. Um, it's a great quote from Jared Spool there. Um, move on and learn from those projects. Get better at vetting your clients and turn down work if, it do if the client doesn't value your work or your process. So develop your gut instinct for when you're, when you're pitching to clients, whether that they're going to be a good client for you. More often, you'll find that it's an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to do better next time and design experiences that both you and your clients can be proud of. Thank you.